We're on a mission from God. Wendy? Stay away! So I got that going. Darling? Looks like I picked the wrong week to quit sniffing blue. Light of my life. We enjoy your films. I am a human being. I thought they smelled bad on the outside. Welcome to Vintage Video, where we're rewatching the 80s so you don't have to. We'll be reviewing every major film release of the 1980s in real time, overanalyzing what you've seen and spoiling what you haven't. I'm Patrick O'Reilly. I'm Jesse Bayless. And I'm Richard Wells. And today marks the 40th anniversary of the release of Fade to Black on October 14th, 1980. It was written and directed by Vernon Zimmerman and released by Compass International. When writer-director Vernon Zimmerman approached Erwin Yablans with his pitch for this movie, Yablans presented him with a similar screenplay he'd written two years prior entitled Alex. Zimmerman then incorporated some of Yablans' ideas for Alex into his own script. Blondie's fully instrumental track Europa off their album Auto America was composed by Chris Stein as a theme for this film but vetoed by producers. Eve Brent won a Saturn Award for her role as Aunt Stella. I thought the music in this was interesting. So it wasn't the Blondie music. It was some other music. No. And that song at the end, Heroes, I actually kind of like that song. It's like a weird song, but I like it. Heroes have so much they to give. But, um, well, this movie felt, the music felt much more 80s to me yes. than anything else we've heard so far. It, w- it had a lot of synth in it. Yes, that's true. We open with audio from an old movie because our lead, Eric Binford, is watching them to fall asleep. He's going through a TV guide and circling titles to tape, settling on a 1953 film called 99 River Street. We pan across his room, which is littered with posters and memorabilia, landing on a projector in the corner. In another room of the house, an elevator is in use. A woman in a wheelchair is coming up to check on Binford in the morning. He is asleep, curled up next to the TV, and she says, Well, look here. Mr. Smart fell asleep with his nose buried in the screen again. One-eyed monster's gonna wreck his eyes. Much less soften his brain! As she, like, pounds on him with a baton. What does that mean? I like, don't know. One eyed, is he watching television with his penis? <laughs> no, the TV is the one-eyed monster. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what, Jesse? <laughs> I was really confused by that line. <laughs> no, the TV is going to wreck his eyes, but that doesn't make sense because his eyes are closed. But if and you then, watch too much TV, you go blind? <laughs> yeah. It's not you get only, hair on yeah. your palms. <laughs> she wakes up and yanks open the window to let some light in. She flips on his tape deck and starts dancing in her chair while Binford gets slowly up to prepare for the day. He steps into the bathroom off of his bedroom to grab a drink and smoke a cigarette, but in the mirror, a crew member is visible just sitting in (laughs) this back room. I was like, what is that guy doing? Are we going to find out why he's here later? Nope. His aunt Stella fills us in on the backstory with some not at all shoehorned exposition. I took you in after your sweet mother died giving birth to you. I had no idea you'd be such a trial. Your mother was beautiful. She was a great talent. Hollywood was at her feet. Important men were begging to marry her. The story goes further and we briefly touch on an accident that cost his aunt her leg when he was four. Evidently he was sick and the babysitter called her against his wishes and somehow a consequent accident took at least one of her legs with it. Her hopes of a dancing career were dashed, and she blames him. Downstairs for breakfast, Stella wishes aloud that he would consume his breakfast the way he consumes VHS tapes. I feel like this is pretty early to have a big pile of VHS tapes of old movies. Yeah. Were people doing that in the 70s when they shot this, for sure? I don't know. I guess maybe they shot this in 1980. Mm-hmm. He takes a grapefruit half off the table and contemplates smashing it in his aunt's face, a la James Cagney in The Public Enemy, but gives up on the plan as she continues to lecture him on his failures as a person. I think we mentioned this scene on the show previously. I don't remember for what purpose, but we brought up the scene where he smashes the grapefruit. Yeah. Was it Little Miss Marker? 
Maybe. I, I, I feel, I'm trying to think of movies that were set in that time. Yeah, it was something where we thought someone was going to smash something in somebody's face, but mm. then it didn't happen. But uh, when we talked about it before, we weren't sure how much of the scene was scripted from when it happened in, in the first film. Apparently, Cagney and Mae Clark discussed the grapefruit smash ahead of time, so she knew it was coming, but she was very surprised to see the take used in the final edit because she thought it was just a plan they cooked up to surprise the crew. Cagney almost reenacts the moment in Billy Wilder's 1-2-3 in a scene with Horst Buchholz, but at the last moment decides against smashing it in Buchholz's face, as Binford decides here. Stella tells him that grapefruit has vitamins, but he stands from his breakfast and stubs out a cigarette in the fruit before walking away to head to work. She's actually not giving him bad meal advice. No, she's <laughs> like, not. As much as she's yelling at him, she's really adamant that he eat his breakfast yeah. and it's important. And I was like, that that's the part you should listen to. Yeah. Well, in general, her advice isn't so bad. You know, like, don't fall asleep to the television. You know, wake up, go to work. Like, these are all things you yeah. need to do. Clean Give up. Give me sensual massages. No, no, uh, no, yeah. no. <clears throat> he checks the mail on his way down the steps and quizzes Stella on his favorite old movies. You're so smart, Stella. Tell me what James Cagney's name was in White Heat. I don't know, and I don't give a damn. Arthur Cody Jarrett. That's who. Stop filling your head with all that useless trivia. This is the part where I feel attacked for obsessing (laughs) over movie details from 40 years ago. (laughs) Binford continues to call her Ma when quoting film lines, and she gets really pissed off about it every time she hears it. Binford arrives at Continental Film Services late apparently it's a massive film vault and he says that the building reminds him of the 1930 film big house but then intentionally or as a joke on his uh, mental problems starts listing off the cast of a different 1955 film big house usa he even mentions charles bronson among the cast who was eight when the big house came out is is this the only voiceover narration that we get from him Uh, maybe I'm, now I'm, that i think about it like i i remember it happening in the movie and you just saying it now i was like i don't know if we get another bit of this i don't recall it being used again he walks through a busy cutting room to stand at his desk a small cubicle wallpapered with framed photos lobby cards and posters apparently dennis christopher brought all these in himself because the set deck did not decorate his yeah. cubicle sufficiently he goes to speak with his boss mr Berger. And the actor here should have played Dan Hedaya's older brother in every Dan yes. Hedaya movie. Mm-hmm. He looks just like him. <laughs> and he sounds like him and he moves He's like him. He's got the mannerisms, yeah. Burger's on the phone with an angry customer on account of something Binford fucked up yesterday. I guess he missed a delivery of one sheets to Sid Fine. He hands the delivery to Binford, who starts to walk away before returning to request gas money for the Vespa. They're in Hollywood proper, so he uses a Vespa to make deliveries. And Berger insists the Vespa should be all gassed up, but then Binford admits, nope, it's empty, and I lost the petty cash. Yeah, so it seems like some of the things he's being yelled at are legitimately his <laughs> Almost yeah, oh, all yeah. of them. Yes. <laughs> yeah, like you are just a bad employee. Yeah. Berger tosses him a couple of bucks and suffers what looks like a mild heart attack as Binford walks away. He scrambles for pills in his pocket, a gesture that reminded me of Jack Warden and used cars earlier this year. Binford peeks around the corner to just watch this guy almost die and take the pills before scoffing at him while he leaves like, oh, stupid heart. I feel like I've seen this in a number of movies, and I don't know if it's just like a movie trope or if it's actually medically accurate. When people are suddenly feeling issues with their heart, can you take a pill and instantly be okay? Nitroglycerin. Yeah. Oh. It's actually a nitroglycerin. My grandfather had to carry them on him whenever really? he was walking around. He had to make sure, and if he's feeling like he was having a heart attack, grab one of the they're very 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 tiny uh what does it do do you know i think it it, um opens up your blood vessels Hmm. so like more more blood can get through there's also um a macgyver episode called final approach where a pilot has to take them but he can't get to the pills before he has a heart attack and dies in the plane and then they crash it into the woods and we were really hoping he would use nitroglycerin for some reason yeah but then he doesn't my grandfather was so funny when he told me, he's like, I, I got nitroglycerin in my pocket. Don't hit me. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> we cut away to our totally unnecessary B-plot. 
a counselor or police psychologist or parole officer type guy named Dr. Moriarty <laughs> is introduced. <laughs> and uh, he's sitting down with Captain Gallagher. Moriarty makes multiple attempts to persuade Gallagher that finding juvenile delinquents jobs to do to pay their own way makes a lot more sense than jailing them at the taxpayer's expense. But Gallagher is unconvinced. Gallagher calls Officer Ann Oshenbull to lead Moriarty to his new office. On their way downstairs, Moriarty rips on Gallagher a bit and Oshenbull jumps to his defense, claiming he was just trying to fill his father's shoes, but his father was shot by some doped up kid in a dark alley. So I liked the idea of, of this fairly progressive thinking for 1980 where we're saying, you know, rehabilitation and, mm-hmm. you know, as opposed to punishment. And then they make this guy the idiot of the movie. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, oh, everything okay. he says is wrong. So I guess you don't actually believe in this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, at the beginning, he has good points where he's like, oh, yeah, it makes sense to have like a work release program and to help these kids and try and like. Uh, restore them and then the rest of the movie he's suddenly like a censorship guy yeah like <laughs> i don't know well, what and, and he i was like yelling at him I was like you idiot at the end of the movie i was like you were the worst yeah, yeah there's, he yeah. makes so many dumb mistakes but it just i was like i was so excited that i'm like yeah this is great this is gonna be like our our, our hero of the of the movie and then like that was so not the case yeah <laughs> moriarty's office is in the basement it's the old drunk tank it's full of boxes and cobwebs Oshimble tells him that she knows about his work history and she was excited to meet him. Now you're here, in the flesh. She twirls her hair flirtatiously as she backs out of his cage. <laughs> <laughs> we cut to Marilyn and her friend Stacy jogging down the beach. Stacy rags on her for jumping on all the weight loss fads like jogging. <laughs> Remember that one? <laughs> that sure came and went. Basic cardio. <laughs> Marilyn, who by the way looks a lot like Marilyn Monroe, but with an Australian accent, reiterates her goal in life is to become a model slash actress and be important in general she's worried that her family back in australia will think she's a failure if she comes home without doing this so this is kind of like the reverse of the man with a bogart's face where he gets he's an actor who looks like bogart who pretends to get surgery to look like bogart versus this woman who just coincidentally looks like Marilyn, yeah but wants to play parts of Marilyn monroe but also (laughs) bogart's secretary looked like marilyn monroe yeah and didn't care about being marilyn monroe and things they decide to top off their exercise with a big meal i'm hungry let's pick out (laughs) back at continental film services eric is leaving the building when he's stopped by a co-worker played by mickey rourke he asks eric to settle a bet what was the fat man's name in the maltese falcon that's easy okay okay what is it and then for some reason he like withholds the answer for a bit like he's going to get something out of these guys but then he says it's casper gutman which how do you forget that gut man and he's yeah. the fat guy before he leaves eric challenges them to a bit of trivia himself he gives them 48 hours to come back with the correct answer or they owe him 20 dollars each 40 dollars total he asks them what's rick's last name in casablanca he tells them they're not allowed to look at the script or watch the movie. They have to come up with it on their own. How is forty-eight hours? There's how would no you way. police this? Yeah. Like mm-hmm. they just go home, watch the movie, and uh, come back the next day and collect their money. Yeah. But he's offering them fifty if they can come up with it, which is more than they would lose. For some reason, they agreed to the bet, but in the next forty-eight hours, they make no effort to find mm-hmm. an answer to this question. And it, and there's no follow through. Yeah. On his. We part. never hear the answer in the movie. Yeah. yeah. It, it also seems like a weird bet because it's a very well-known movie and like we said he'll have no way to prove they didn't just watch it Mm -hmm. eric takes the vespa out to chief diner's coffee shop for his lunch break in the same coffee shop stacy is talking Marilyn out of the entertainment industry she said that she went to school with a girl who looked like lana turner who eventually killed herself because she didn't make it big eric notices Marilyn sitting in the booth and he's instantly enamored he has a quick foggy daydream of her singing happy birthday to you with Marilyn Monroe's voice for him. He slides across a row of bar stools to get closer to them, but none of this is covert, and both girls just watch him confused. Well, and, like, this this fantasy, this daydream fantasy scene goes on for, like, a while, yeah. and the whole time he's just staring straight at her, yeah. making a goofy face, and I'm like, 
how is she okay with this? Like, yeah. I, 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 like the, the amount of awkward and creepiness to this, like, you would never, ever, ever have a girl be like, yeah, let's go. Let's, yeah. let's get together. No, she's definitely got a screw loose also. Yeah, because and, <laughs> and it, it's going to get worse yeah. before it gets better. Yeah. Eric tries to tell her who she looks like when Stacy interrupts and says, yeah, we know. Eric tells her that he's a great admirer, and Marilyn O'Connor introduces herself, so her name is Marilyn. She extends a hand for him to shake, and Stacy asks, what are you doing? <laughs> she's just pissed off at her friend for stupidly engaging with this weirdo. To prove she's not Marilyn Monroe, Eric asks her what movie Tom Ewell took her to see in the film The Seven Year Itch. She claims to have forgotten, and he gives her hints. It was a horror movie. Let me think. I'll give you a clue. He was green and slimy. Her first guess, Frankenstein, is not a terrible one, since he's often portrayed as green and presumably slimy because he's a rotting corpse. But instead of just telling her no, Eric launches into a full-body impersonation of the creature from the Black Lagoon, including weird slurping noises with his <laughs> mouth. It's very disturbing. It is. <laughs> Marilyn's second guess, though, is the werewolf, which makes no sense because he is neither green nor slimy. Stacy asks, who cares? And rightly so. Eric responds, it was a creature from the Black Lagoon. Stupid. Way, but, to, way to endure yourself to right? these women. Yeah. By this point, Eric is flying more red flags than Magic Mountain, and these women should stop talking to him immediately. Marilyn, on the other hand, is somehow fixated on Eric. She asks him how he knew the answer to his own dumb trivia question <laughs> and then asks if he can give her a ride back to work. Stacy is dumbfounded. Are you serious? <laughs> Eric warns her that he came on a Vespa and that doesn't slow her down at all for some reason. As they ride back to her job, she tells him about growing up in Australia. Eric tells her he used to watch three movies a day for a year and he never missed once. I did something like this, kind of. Yeah, yeah. you're a crazy person, I, I was trying to watch a movie I hadn't seen every day, and I kept it up for two years. I'm assuming with three a day, you watch a lot of repeats. Uh, she well, tells especially him, in 1980. Yeah. You know, you, you can't, can't have that many. There's just not that many movies available to you. She tells him that a man in her town used to bring a truck by and play the same two movies over and over again. It was a Julie Andrews double feature of Mary Poppins and The Sound of Music. Eric tells her that someday he's going to own his own movie theater and play whatever he wants, whenever he wants. Eric drops her off at her job, a shop called The United Skates of America. When she walks away, he says, see you in the movies, which she mishears as, see you at the movies, as though he were inviting her on a date, and she quickly agrees to it and asks where and when they'll meet. He suggests ships at eight tonight in Westwood. She agrees. She asks what movie they're seeing, and he tells her it's a surprise. Back in Moriarty's basement, he's taking advantage of his free time by doing bumps of coke and playing harmonica frantically. He's actually really good at the harmonica. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Officer Oshimble watches from outside his cage and shakes her head a bit at this mischievous coke habit when finally he notices her watching. We cut directly to them in bed at yeah. her home. I guess doing cocaine as a, really does it for her yep. as a police officer. That's all she needed. Moriarty arises from the sheets where they have a full box of Ritz crackers under the blankets. They flip on the TV. Apparently, though the scene was in the script, the cast were not informed ahead of time that the scene would require nudity, and the actress was very uncomfortable with it because she happened to be pregnant at the time. To chill them out, they were offered wine on the set, which was less frowned upon for <laughs> pregnant women at the time, but fear not. The healthy baby boy was born August 26th of 1980 and grew up to be Chris Pine. <laughs> what? Yeah. <laughs> what? Yeah. So he's in this scene too, sort of. <laughs> the, the first story that comes on the news is a segment about a plane that crashed somewhere. Like a small single passenger plane, single prop. Somehow eyewitnesses describing the crash reminds Moriarty of Gallagher back at the office and he starts ripping on him again. Oshinbull again jumps to Gallagher's defense, but then somehow she sidesteps to talking about how sexist the station was when she got there. I forgot that the, the captain's name was Gallagher, and I was like, the comedian? I fucking hate Gallagher. <laughs> what is the deal with the watermelons? <laughs> Moriarty asks why she decided to become a cop, and she mentioned a recent news story about a girl in San Diego who killed her neighbors and blamed it on television. 
This infuriates Moriarty, who mentions another case of a child stabbing his friend and complaining that the stab wounds weren't as deep as they are in the movies. Are we now establishing that this hippie guy who rides a bike to work and wants to help criminals actually reform and make a life for themselves is also very pro-censorship for some reason and blames television for all violence? Immediately after criticizing television violence, Moriarty picks up her service weapon and starts swinging it around the room like it's a toy. Yeah. He asks if she knows how to use it, and she says, yeah, it makes a big bang. To close the scene, he suddenly says, I never fucked a cop before. (laughs) Out of nowhere. We cut across town, and even though Eric just dropped Marilyn off at her job, he's watching her through the windows with sunglasses on as she receives a delivery that he's left for her. Apparently, Stacy works here, too because they're both behind the counter. So it makes even less sense now that she would ask Eric for right. a ride back <laughs> to her job when Stacy had to go there too. Marilyn finds the gift and unrolls it to hang it on the wall. It's a one sheet for a Monroe film, subtly titled Let's Make Love. She pretends that she has a secret admirer, even though she for sure knows who left it. That night, Aunt Stella rolls in on Eric prepping for his date. He speaks in an impression of someone who is decidedly not Cary Grant, but somehow Stella can tell what he's trying to do. I like to imagine that this is a long con and she's just convincing him that he sounds like Cary Grant to embarrass him in the future. We have purposely trained him wrong as a joke. (laughs) This is where I noticed a calendar for the new Beverly on the wall in Binford's room. We've mentioned the new Beverly earlier this year as it was featured briefly in the background of Happy Hooker Goes Hollywood. And this is probably as good a title as any to go a little deeper into the theater's history. The building housing the theater dates back to the 1920s. It originally operated as a candy store and was later converted to a theater hosting variety performers like Dean Martin, Jerry Lewis, and Jackie Gleason, who we just saw as Smokey in Smokey and the Bandit Part 2, and Phil Silvers, who coincidentally appears as William B. Warkoff in The Happy Hooker Goes Hollywood. From there, it became a nightclub called Slapsy Maxies, named (laughs) after the boxer and film actor Maxie Rosenblum. The space didn't become a movie theater until the late 50s, cycling through ownership as the New York Theater, the Europa, specializing in foreign films, and the Eros, a porno theater, and finally the Beverly Cinema. The Eros closed in September of 1977 and changed management months later to Sherman Torgan, who was still operating the theater when I first visited in the late 90s. The father of one of my classmates, who still works as a successful writer-director, loaded us up into a car and took us out for a Kubrick double feature of Dr. Strangelove and I think Full Metal Jacket, which was Kubrick's latest film at the time. Sherman Torgan programmed double features for the theater continuously from 1978 through to his death from a heart attack in July of 2007. At the time, the theater was already going through a rough patch, and toward the end of that year, it looked like it might have to close its doors. A fundraising raffle was organized, with the top prize being your choice of any midnight movie screening. I bought like $300 worth of raffle tickets (laughs) because I was determined to win the midnight movie, and sure enough, Clue Gulliger pulled my name out of the hat. Soon after, a barrage of filmmakers started organizing film festivals out of the theater, including Tarantino, Edgar Wright, Eli Roth, Diablo Cody, Patton Oswalt, and I think we went to every night of all of those. In fact, the first seven or eight dates I took you on were to the Edgar Wright Film Festival, (laughs) The Right Stuff, in 2007. And it worked. It worked. (laughs) To officially save the theater, Quentin Tarantino bought the building it operates out of, effectively becoming the landlord of the New Beverly. Michael Torgan, the son of Sherman, continued to program double features from 2007 to 2014 when the programming duties were taken over by Tarantino himself. Doubles programming is typically suspended briefly for the release of each new Tarantino film, but the doubles continued running until March of this year, when the theater closed until further notice on orders from L.A. Mayor Eric Garcetti on account of the COVID-19 pandemic. As soon as it opens back up, I intend to visit more regularly, despite our commute, because I miss it dearly. (laughs) I still haven't spent my midnight movie, though I doubt it's still valid on account of the theater changing hands. I sent over a couple of requests at the time, but none of what I asked for was easy to come by. I think my first request was 1983's Duel to the Death, a longtime favorite of mine, but I was informed by Phil Blankenship that the title was especially difficult to find, and at the time, the theater was only set up for 35mm. Not that I wanted to watch that on DVD or anything. At one point, I toyed with Stuart Raffles' Tammy and the T-Rex as an option, (laughs) but I never pulled the trigger on it. Anyway, back to the movie. To pay for his date, Eric has to borrow some cash from Aunt Stella, and we get the most loaded comment in the film. May I have a small loan at the usual rate of interest, please? On one condition, that you come straight home right after the movie. 
I want my back rub tonight. Though not specifically incestuous, it certainly comes across that way. <laughs> we cut to Marilyn at a bar with her male coworker, and then across town to Eric outside ships asking people what time it is. She's already very late for their date. Marilyn's coworker invites her back to his studio, and in Eric's POV, we're suddenly seeing lots of theater marquees. We see Kramer versus Kramer and all that jazz from the 70s and a bunch of the 80s. We'll come back to them later. He approaches a few other platinum blondes, but none are Marilyn. Marilyn realizes with shock that she's forgotten her date with Eric. Like, how and, does this happen? Like, she did. She, so she made a date with Eric. Yeah. Uh, like sh- she was the one that basically kind of had the idea. Like he didn't. He didn't even really say let's go out on a date. So it was like her idea. So if she had already had plans, you would think she wouldn't do that. I think she made the plans with her coworker after she made the date with Eric. Yeah, yes. but then <sighs> what? Why would you do that? <laughs> and also, what reminded her here? Like, she was just about to go home with this guy. Presumably, that would be the thing that was foremost on her mind. But suddenly, she's like, oh, my God, uh, Eric, I got to go. And she just runs. Eric walks past a bunch more marquees puffing a cigarette. Marilyn gets to ships, but it's way too late. And she's looking desperately for Eric, but he's not here anymore. He stops by a boot shop, and he sees a cardboard cutout of a cowboy behind a boot display. He asks a woman what time the bus stops by. And she tells him, I'm working. I ain't waiting for no bus. I'm trying to catch a ride on my back. He offers her 10 bucks for whatever that gets him, and she hops in someone else's car. Hope you freeze your balls off, if you got any. At home, Eric is watching a print of 1947's Kiss of Death projected on the wall of his room. A gangster is lecturing the mother of a man he's looking for, and when she lies about his whereabouts, he binds her to her wheelchair with an electrical cord and pushes her down a flight of stairs. While Eric is fixated on the scene, his aunt pounds on his bedroom door, no doubt upset about neglecting her back rub. She threatens to use the key if he doesn't answer, and just as the scene in Kiss of Death reaches its climax, she tears down the projector with her baton, and it crashes to the floor in unison with the wheelchair in the film clattering down the stairs, now projected crooked across his wall. Stella apologizes half-acidly. I'm sorry. I said I'm sorry! She rolls into another room crowded with props and film reels. Her chair is malfunctioning. She shouts to him that she intends to throw all of his memorabilia away. He sees flashes of Kiss of Death in his head, and he nudges her chair, which suddenly powers on and continues rolling Stella forward. She rolls out onto the porch and then turns to roll down the stairs, all without his intervention. Are you sure? Because I feel like he's pushing her. I think he... I I thought that too, but in the second watch... He, he nudges her when she's stuck in the room. Okay. But after that, his hands are up. He's just letting her roll forward. Okay. And she's screaming for him to help stop it, but he's not stopping it. Okay, because I thought like he was just taking advantage of the fact that she thought it was malfunctioning and just like pushing it forward. And maybe he's moving it with his legs or something and I'm missing something, but it looked to me like he's just letting her die. He's okay. not helping. But he he did give it a little yes. push. He so definitely to, nudged to, it to, to start. To get it going. Yeah. And, and let it keep m- malfunctioning. But once she rolls out onto the porch, then she turns to roll down the stairs, and he's just laughing maniacally the whole time. The implication here is that she dies in this fall, but she's sitting upright in the chair all the way down. It doesn't actually tip forward until the very last step, but she is motionless on the ground under the chair, so I think she's supposed to be dead here well, even. She's, she's uh, feeble. Yes. Mm-hmm. And she could still be alive, but he's not doing anything to help her. Right, he's just and laughing just- and... At the top of the stairs, he just reads off the top billing of Kiss of Death before laughing some more. Kiss of Death. Starring Victor Mature. Brian Donlevy. Colleen Gray. <laughs> With Richard Widmack. Taylor Holmes. Howard Smith. Kyle Back in his bathroom, he cries in the mirror, washes his face, and nearly vomits with disgust about what he's done. At Stella's rainy funeral, the Reverend tells Eric, there's no room next to Monroe, but there are other sites. He hands Eric her ashes and says they'll decide on a final resting place later. He also, the priest also asks for money. Yeah, and uh, he gives it to him. Yeah, and I don't know if that was just payment for the services or if he was trying to bribe the priest for a better location hmm. yeah. for the urn. The reverend leaves in a limo, 
and he asks if he'll see Eric at the memorial, and he says, no, I don't believe in God. Well, he believes in you, and then he does this weird weasel laugh. <laughs> like, why did we even have a service? <laughs> yeah. Back at home, Eric tosses out all of Stella's health literature into the fireplace. Carrots can make you well. Health for the handicapped. Prunes for health. He drops a cigarette butt in her urn. And he tapes a newspaper clipping of her fatal wheelchair accident to the fridge, where I assumed it would soon be joined by a collection of other future victims, but no, it's just this one clipping still at the end. <laughs> a needlessly hot male lady delivers the mail. <laughs> but, it's, it's LA, it's very warm. But she delivers it to the door when she sees a new name, C. Jarrett, on the mailbox. Well, I think she was just confused. Right. Eric gets very mad when she calls him Eric at the door. I don't know what you're talking about. The name is Jarrett. Got it? On her way back down the steps, she also notices that the road sign has been changed to read 99 River Street, a reference to the 1953 film of the same name, a poster for which hangs in Eric's mess of a room. This shot was confusing to me, though, and maybe because I didn't notice the 99 River Street thing earlier. Yeah. But, like, I don't remember what his street was you know like I, I didn't i'm like i assume that we're looking at this sign right now because it's changed but i yeah. didn't i'm like i don't remember they did show it earlier and it was something else yeah, they did but i th i think we were supposed to recognize it when we see 99 river street from earlier when he decided to tape it oh, out okay. of the tv guy. i think i must not have been paying that close and, of attention and i'm assuming he had the original prop for the street sign because no i think he printed something out that matched it, as I say, his like own he, road sign. He, he sure got that made yeah, very quick. That's true. Well, that's not the well, most impressive thing It looked like it was made out of like cardboard or something. Yeah. <laughs> He's going to do much more amazing things that's later true. in the movie with zero resources. Yes. We cut from her leaving to Eric with exactly half of his face made up to look like Dracula. The point of it being half of his face is for the reveal when he turns to camera from looking totally normal <laughs> to half made up. But in reality, this is a super inefficient way to apply makeup. He's even dyed half of his hair black just to prank the invisible audience. It's so, like, and it's so clean and precise, like, yeah. the line down his face. Like, it's you have Victor to work Victoria hard style. to get it to look like that. And and I was like, oh, okay, so this is going to be like a, I don't know, like a fan of the opera kind of thing happening here. But uh, And, and then, and then, then we immediately out, cut full to full makeup. Yeah. <laughs> That night, he attends a screening of George Romero's Night of the Living Dead and slowly nibbles on his popcorn as the monsters on screen nibble on the entrails of humans. And the monsters in the audience talk over the movie. <laughs> we cut from here to Marilyn's house. They're just monsters because they're talking over the yes, movie, not because they're they? dressed that way. Exactly. <laughs> we cut from here to Marilyn's house. Who knows where? Certainly not Eric, as far as we've established. <laughs> She stumbles drunkenly around her home on the way to a shower behind a translucent curtain a la Psycho. Eric impossibly enters the bathroom and throws open the curtain to approach her with a fountain pen. We get a few familiar inserts from Psycho's famous shower scene, but here Eric drops the pen, terrified by her screams, and runs away. I only wanted your autograph. We see the pen on the shower floor leaking ink into the drain to resemble the blood from Psycho, if for some reason Gus Van Zant had decided to shoot the film in black and white. The prostitute from the night before heads to her car in the parking lot of Brandelli's Brig. He, he sure keeps tabs on people. Yeah. She hears a voice and looks around to no avail. Suddenly Eric rises in full vampire garb and we see clips from one of the Christopher Lee Hammer Dracula movies. He blocks her path to the car and eventually she just runs away and he gives chase. In a residential neighborhood, trying to race through a yard, she trips on a child's toy car and is impaled on a fence post through the neck. So this is the second person that he didn't actually kill, technically, just but who died trying to get away from him. Yeah, um, this might be a case of manslaughter? Yeah, maybe. Or vampire slaughter. Eric touches the wound and then tastes some of her blood before going full vamp on it and drinking it directly from the neck wound. At work the next day, Eric is confronted by his asshole co-workers, Richie and Bart. By the way, Bart here, the non-Mickey Rourke co-worker. I, I left him out of the credits because he really doesn't have much, but unless there's two people named Hennon Chambers, I'm fairly certain that he also has writing credits for the pilot of a Jeopardy-style quiz show called Trump Card, featuring our current president in a cameo. His first foray into reality television didn't fare well because Trump Card was not picked up for a full season order. 
There are two Hen and Chambers on IMDb, but I think the pages could probably be combined. The co-workers drop a newspaper into his lap, detailing the grisly murder of a local prostitute. Ironically, Dracula and prostitutes are referred to on occasion as the less dead. It's also weird that they immediately suspect him as going out as Dracula. They said there were seven Draculas spotted. Was I thought he said there were know. hundreds of Draculas at the screen. Oh, it was like Draculas. <laughs> yeah, Draculas. <laughs> but but it was just weird that they would suspect him. I mean, I don't know if they're just trying to make a joke or if they have like legitimate evidence. Yeah, no, I think they're just picking on him. I guess the cops found the body with the lip prints around the wound and made a connection to the horror screening nearby, though even the article mentions there were a hundred Draculas at the show, and somehow Richie, the Mickey Rourke guy, has deduced that Eric was one of them. They don't even know for sure that he went to this. Like, yeah. They're assuming that he went to it and that he was the one who did this. It would be different if he had mentioned that he was going to it. Right, but he never says anything about it. They throw a loop of 35 millimeter film around his neck when he doesn't respond, and Eric tears it off and walks away from them. At the end of the workday, Eric reminds them of the Casablanca bet and the $40 they owe him, and they just blow him off. He shouts more useless trivia after them. She didn't know what Adolf Hitler's favorite movie was. Broadway Melody, I bet you didn't know that. But what about Cry of Battle and War as Hell? Where were they playing, huh? At the Texas Theater where they caught Oswald the day he shot Kennedy. I bet you didn't know that. We cut to Eric watching William Boyd in Hopalong Cassidy at home. The use of these clips without the copyright holder's approval, resulted in a $15 million lawsuit against the film, although the results of the lawsuit are unclear. $15 million? You always overbid when you're putting the lawsuit together and then you hope they settle for something. $5. Yes. We see a William Boyd mask, a cowboy hat, and a six-shooter on his dresser. We cut out to a carnival where Eric's co-workers are stealing carnival prizes. As they walk along the boardwalk, Richard asks a passing older gentleman. <laughs> hey, Jack, where you hiding all the pussy, man? Las Vegas. I lived there for four years. Las Vegas. We ain't gonna go to Las Vegas. I really like this exchange because it comes completely out of nowhere and it felt real like they just improvised it on the set. Once they get away from the crowds, they hear a jingle, jingle, jingle from the fog in an alleyway. What's that noise, anyway? And a cowboy in a rubber mask shows up and Richie recognizes it as William Boyd. Hey, Whatever happened to the cop therapist guy? Anyway, the cowboy lures Richie into a duel, but only the cowboy's gun has any bullets in it. Richie outdraws the cowboy, but shoots nothing, and then the cowboy fires a bullet to make Richie dance. Bart runs off, leaving Richie alone to plead for his life. The cowboy asks Richie how it feels now, and he recognizes the voice. It's Marilyn. Just kidding, it's Eric. You knew that. Now yeah. Richie knows it. Well, and, and this would have been a good moment to introduce the Casablanca. Right bet yeah of what was the answer like 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 he could have made a thing like like if you tell me the answer i won't kill you yeah because he would be so smug to know that he doesn't know the answer now richie knows it but only long enough to take five shots in the chest and not long enough to wrap up the casablanca bet sub subplot it's rick blaine by the way which is hardly trivia but i feel like this movie might be to blame for it being common knowledge now like movie buffs spread it around after this came out yeah but yeah richie's dead and the cowboy jingle jangles off into the fog we cut to the police station the next day, and I'm not sure what's happening here. Bart and Eric are exiting the station together, and on my first pass, I thought that Eric was bailing him out. That's what I thought was happening. But the first thing Bart says is, you think they suspect me of killing Richie? Which makes me think he must not have been arrested for it, or he would know or that they were the all just they... being questioned. Yeah. yeah. Well, because uh, Bart at least witnessed something. Yeah. He, he may not have witnessed the murder, but he certainly witnessed an armed person firing live ammunition at them. But why would Eric have been brought in for questioning at all? Uh, I guess if they went into their, yeah, that, yeah I don't got Well, he does say it. though, uh, Bart says here, they even brought in Mr. Berger. So they must've talked Just to a few people office. at work. Yeah. And the, they said the other name that was on the chalkboard, Maria Valdez or whatever. Um, they were like, Oh, there's another girl that worked in the same building with them. Also, wouldn't Eric have been in questioning for a lot longer since he has a motive in some of the other recent murders and specific clues linking him to the scenes? Well, uh, I mean, I guess the only other murder was the hooker. Yeah. Well, and they didn't really investigate it, but his aunt's death. Yeah, but that could be ruled as an accident. Yeah. Um, but the and but they have no way of connecting him to the hooker. Other than that, he was at that screening that night. 
Right, but as a Dracula, no one knows it was him. That's true. But it just seems like if they found one of those Draculas, and he also is connected to this other murder, that's something. Uh, To make a point about how wide their search is, Bart mentions that the cops even dragged in Mr. Berger for questioning, and he's due for heart surgery soon. Eric takes note of this. Hey, back in the basement drunk tank, Moriarty has three names on his chalkboard. Eric Binford, Maria Valdez, and Mr. Berger are the suspects that he's narrowed it down to. What is his job title again? Right on cue, Gallagher shows up and chews him out for essentially running an unauthorized investigation out of their basement. Now who the hell gave you the authority to test them? I cooked up this questionnaire to help flush out a suspect. Flush? That's exactly the right word for the way I'm feeling about your actions. This doesn't make any sense. No. I, he he would never do this because he's that's not his job. He's there to like rehabilitate people and to yeah. like be a an advocate and like why are you investigating murder at all? He wouldn't even be tempted to do this. Like this is nowhere near his job description. And where did he get these names? Like, <laughs> that's true. Yeah, I, don't I don't even know. understand how he's like getting this information. Right, because I'm assuming the police questioned these people, and then he somehow intercepted them while they yeah. were at the station. Is like, yeah. come with me. I have some additional questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so now it's Moriarty's turn to be defended by Oshambol when she insists that he's really onto something here. No, he isn't because he's not a detective. He's not allowed to be onto anything. Well, I mean, they're allowed to bring in other experts that can help them with their case, like right. psychologists or something. They can bring somebody in, but they A, they didn't bring him in to do that. Right. And B, I don't even think he's like a psychologist or anything yeah, like that. Yeah, he doesn't he, seem licensed. He's, 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 a, he's a doctor, but we don't know of what. Yeah. I, I guess we could assume psychology. Moriarty says that he believes that the Dracula and cowboy killings are linked and Gallagher tells him he doesn't give a fuck and to stop pretending to be a police officer. If I were Oshambol, I would start suspecting Moriarty right here because he's clearly a basket case who likes to role play as things he isn't. Eric is suddenly, for the first time in the film, hitchhiking and is immediately picked up by a guy driving a 34 Auburn Speedster. The one used in the film was a replica, but a real one sold in 2016 for $313,000. This is where I assumed we were starting a dream sequence because none of what follows would ever happen. (laughs) Eric holds a pile of scripts in the passenger seat and asks if this guy wrote him. And he says, I mostly produce now. His name's Gary Bialy and Eric is actually familiar with his work. The driver sparks up a joint and hands it to Eric, but for whatever reason won't take it back, adding to the dreamlike quality. A big shot producer just picked me up out of the blue in a ridiculous luxury car and dumped a bunch of drugs in my lap for free. Eric tells the guy a quick logline for a movie idea he's got. A couple of criminals join up with a carnival, and it's called Alabama and the Forty Thieves. I like it a lot. He wants Bogdanovich to direct, preferably in black and white, but before he can share much of the real story, he tells Bialy to pull over, because this is his stop. It's like, I would just sit in this car and talk to this guy for the rest of the day. He prances giddily into his house to announce the great news to Aunt Stella before remembering that she's dead. (laughs) He tells her the news and apologizes before collapsing with a migraine on the floor. We finally made it, Ma. And it hurts. It hurts bad, Ma. We see him wandering around Man's Chinese Theater. He takes a picture of Marilyn Monroe's handprints. He walks past Julie Andrews' star. He takes Polaroid photos of buildings Monroe used to live in. He's shouting crazily at the people who live there. Do you know when this was the Hollywood Studio Club that uh, Gail Storm and Sharon Tate and then Marilyn Monroe all lived in room 334? Give me a break. But you didn't know that, huh? And he angrily whiffs a Polaroid at the back of a girl's head as she walks away from him. Eric stops for a bite to eat kitty corner from the Brown Derby and asks the guy working the counter if he's ever seen Monroe coming out. She's been dead for years, man. You're wrong. What are you talking about? You said you're wrong. She's alive as you and I. And as he sweeps his order off the counter to the ground and walks away without paying for any of it, the guy at the desk reads my favorite line of the entire movie. She's dead! She's dead, you jerk! (laughs) (laughs) I don't understand why this guy is so invested on proving this customer wrong. (laughs) I think he just found something that will piss the guy off, and he wants to piss him off as much as him sweeping all the food to the ground. But I just love the delivery of, She's dead, you jerk! Eric pops into a poster shop and buys a few more Monroe posters. On his way out, he almost leaves a handful of cash on the table until the clerk points it out, and then he collects it. I don't know what the point of that moment is, 
other than to imply that when he says I lost the petty cash, that they're literally just implying he's just lazy, like he's bad with cash and he just mm-hmm. leaves it places. Or he's just becoming more and more absent minded, like not in reality. Yeah, maybe. In his room, Eric listens to Halloween on the TV while jerking off to Marilyn Monroe glossies that he just bought. We see clips of her singing happy birthday in the diner from his first fantasy, and then he calls Monroe a bitch while he's doing it, but when he's done, he apologizes. He rolls the Vespa out to work and confronts Mr. Berger outside. He keeps grabbing at his boss and eventually mentions his upcoming wedding. I can't picture the creature who'd want to marry you. Tell me, who is this unlucky girl? She's a famous actress. And who might this famous actress be? Marilyn Monroe. Oh, shit. (laughs) His boss is just like, oh, okay, whatever. He just turns around to walk away. When he continues to grab at Burger, he is promptly fired and asked to leave the premises. Eric is insisting to be referred to as Cody because he's in character as Cody Jarrett again, but he's still Eric enough to demand access to the building to retrieve the collectible posters that he left around his desk. Burger doesn't let him in, and he leaves, kicking the Vespa over on his way out, and Burger gets mad enough to need his medicine again. That night, we hear heavy breathing in POV as someone wanders through the stacks of the film reels in this building. Berger is working late when he's startled by the security guard. Mr. Berger, sir. Jesus Christ, Sam. You scared the shit out of me. He wants to leave for coffee, and Berger asks for one too, because he's going to be here all night fixing Binford's fucked up paperwork. Suddenly, lights are going out all around the building. (laughs) The cobweb-covered building. (laughs) Yeah, I'm like, don't people work here? (laughs) (laughs) Why are there so many cobwebs? (laughs) Yeah, it doesn't make sense. Film rolls are popping off the shelves at him. He tries to flip a switch in his office and he gets zapped by it. Suddenly, a mummy arm bursts through a wall over the posters behind him. This is all so elaborate. Like, I don't even understand how you would, like, rig this to spark Mm -hmm. when he flicks the switch and to make sure all those reels are flying off. Like, this doesn't make any sense. The mummy moves around the wall to chase Berger until he has a fatal heart attack in the stacks. The mummy kicks his pills out of his reach and then laughs at him as he dies. In an appliance store the next day, Eric sees Gary Bialy on a talk show pitching Alabama and the 40 Thieves. Before he can explain where he got the idea, they cut to a commercial, and instantly a phone on set is ringing. Apparently, in the ensuing 15 seconds, Eric has managed to run outside to a phone booth and successfully guess the number of the red phone on stage. (laughs) Gary denies ever having met Eric and says he doesn't pick up hitchhikers. After Gary hangs up, Eric switches into a James Cagney character and hops into an impossibly expensive car to drive to a barber shop where he just happens to know that producer Bialy will be celebrating his birthday. Can we talk though a second about how what a terrible idea like this just happened. Like you just picked this guy up and he gave you this idea. What a terrible producer are you that you go on television before you have a script and a copyright and like yeah. anything and you start yeah, like talking yesterday. about it. Like you are going to get it stolen too. Yeah. He's <laughs> like Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll go copyright that right now, and I'll park the URL, and, <laughs> yeah. and they'll force the buy from me. Like, where did you then get this car? And Also, how did the guy the get gun? from the studio all the way to this haircut place Well, instantly? I, not knowing enough about where he works, other than that they handle film and posters, I'm wondering if they also maybe deal in props. Or, right, but or, it's not a prop Tommy gun. No, no, but but <laughs> if he had access to the car. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, but yeah, also getting a vintage Thompson machine gun. Uh, I don't know how available those those are. <laughs> the producer is sitting here at the barber shop getting a birthday cake handed to him, like in the barber chair. Like this is not a sanitary place to eat a cake. <laughs> this would be like everyone's having a slice of cake and just going. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Hairball. Um when Eric walks in, he's wearing this pinstripe mafia suit, and he's got the Tommy gun out. Right, which he had in a case. Right. Like a, I don't know. <laughs> right, like it was a, a guitar case in the car. It was a guitar case or something, which wouldn't didn't even close completely. But then, you know, the reason that you would put the gun in there is to, like, hide it and be secretive about it when you bring mm-hmm. it in somewhere so people aren't suspecting you of anything. But he takes it out of that case in the car and then just walks into this place <laughs> in broad gun. daylight with the gun out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's not thinking it through. But everyone thinks this is a birthday telegram until Eric fires some warning shots through a lamp and a bottle on a shelf. 
Everyone leaves, but Bialy still isn't buying it. I'm not sure I do either, because in the wide shot, the lamp and bottles are fine. So Eric fires the gun again, and we see the same inserts of the same things exploding a second time. <laughs> this time they stay shattered, though. When Bialy asks who Eric is, he again breaks character to reveal himself as the hitchhiker, which I think is a habit that makes him seem more in control of his condition than I would have preferred. Yeah. I would like for him to stay in character when he's killing people, right. but he keeps breaking it so that he can let people know who he is. So like whatever, you know, psychosis is, is, is taking over his brain. He is turning into these characters. Right. It's not here, a choice. He never told his boss who he was. Yeah. And here he's not even wearing makeup. So there would be no reason that the producer couldn't just be like, hey, wait a minute. You're that kid. It's yeah. like, I don't know what you're talking about. See? Well, yeah. but also, I mean, we'll get to the next scene. But he's immediately ID'd. Right. Yeah. From, from walking out in broad daylight. That's true. Eric fills the producer full of holes and compliments a parakeet on its singing voice on the way out. You got nice pipes, pal. Drop by the club sometime. Eric gets away with this murder scot-free because nobody bothers to call the police or hang around to arrest him. But they do identify him, like you Mm -hmm. said. Marilyn and Stacy go shopping in Venice when Marilyn notices a big sign advertising a photographer in need of Monroe lookalikes. Stacy insists on joining her to this photographer's office. We cut to Eric's home, already swarming with police, and they're taking down the 99 River Street sign. Evidently, something led the cops here, so one of those people must have been able to ID him, yeah. even though nobody knows him, Right. and reported it to the police. Moriarty is still trying to insist that Binford is a good kid outside. Captain, listen to me. Binford is not crazy. He's a victim of the society. Believe me. Oh, that's beautiful. The man runs around in a Dracula and a mummy outfit killing people, but he's okay. How would they have associated the mummy thing with him? Yeah. I don't know. Because, like, first of all, it looked like the boss had a heart attack. Why would they assume there was a mummy there? It's th- there was no video yeah, there wasn't evidence a security guard, of it. And like, he died in the office where he was working. Yeah, nobody saw him dressed as a mummy. <laughs> Although I I do I would like to think that he just walked out of the uh, warehouse shambling dressed, dressed like, as a like just yeah. a shambling he's like we saw a mummy shambling out of the uh, <laughs> old warehouse he just went down the street and and now there's a dead guy it's like an episode of Scooby Doo <laughs> I do like Gallagher's response of oh yeah that's great yeah no he must be fine but I feel like I probably would have just gone with excuse me sir this is an active crime scene please leave the premises. <laughs> Moriarty points out that the name on the mailbox is C. Jarrett now and wonders aloud what that means. And we cut to Blow Up Photo Studio at night, named after the Antonioni film about a photographer trying to solve a murder. How the fuck does any of this exist? Eric owns a whole building with a full security system with his name on everything? Well, uh, earlier someone asks him what he's doing with all the money that his aunt left him. Yeah. And so I don't don't think the whole building is his, but I'm assuming he's renting out space. But it has a full security with his name printed on the door and he's got – and that's presumably what he spent on the car and the suit and the gun and everything. Oh, that's true. But how much money could this lady possibly have been worth? She was elderly and she was in a wheelchair. She's a, she's already like – Right, and her career was cut short. Yeah. Like she wasn't she like – She had no way to make yeah. money. Well, on that note too, how was Eric affording all that stuff? All these vintage – I mean I know it's 1980 but still – some of these posters are from the 1930s. They're still 50 years old. That's true. He's just getting all this stuff to hang up all over his room. Not even not even like framed or being stored in a museum quality. Well, I don't think he's paying rent or anything. So he's <laughs> probably just spending hundreds of dollars a month it's on all, this. That's where all the petty cash went. <laughs> Eric buzzes them in and Stacy decides just from the lobby that this Jared guy must not be the murdering type. So she leaves. We get a quick insert of Moriarty and Oshimble driving around. Marilyn enters the back office where Eric is waiting in a bizarre princely outfit. Can we talk about though what how did how did how did he arrange it so that she would specifically see this advert that he put out in Venice and only get her to show up to the studio? So like it just seems so unlikely. That's true. Like that she would be the one to come across it and she'd be the one to call and not a thousand other girls. 
And Especially <laughs> since in, in order to even catch her, he must have put this sign in like two or three different places. And right. been sitting at a telephone, answering it and turning people down left and right until she called. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, it was in Venice where she works, but it should have been literally like right outside of just the United States. Just put a flyer in her mailbox in or her, something. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, or and at the top it just says, don't worry, everyone's getting these. <laughs> if you look like Marilyn Monroe. Uh, but apparently he could have just shown up and handed it to her directly because she does not recognize him <laughs> yeah, at all. That's true. Well, he <laughs> is talking with like an accent. That would have been enough to throw her off. He tells her that for this photo shoot, they're going to be recreating the 1957 Prince and the Showgirl starring Monroe and Laurence Olivier. See, I would have gone for some like it hot. I, th- I think he could have been a, a really great nice Tony try. Curtis. <laughs> Again, this was a Dennis Christopher suggestion though, that they do this whole scene. Mm. Um, back in the police car, Moriarty and Oshimble trade important factoids, despite apparently having been in the car with each other all day. Moriarty says, see, Jarrett was Cagney in White Heat. And she says, Stella was his mom. She never told Eric the truth. <laughs> no idea how they could possibly have solved the Cagney mystery unless somebody at the station just happened to know that off the top of their head. It's also not clear how these cops could possibly know that Stella never told Eric the truth about being his mother <laughs> unless they had mics all over the house the whole time. But who knows? For the last like 20 years. Yeah. <laughs> Eric gives Marilyn a glass of champagne with some kind of medicine in it. And she tells him she knows who he is before we cut back to the police car. Over the radio in the police car, they get a tip on the location of Eric's Packard. And Oshimble says, I know a shortcut. And she swerves recklessly through a gas station, crashing through an improbably stacked pyramid of empty cans in the middle of the road. She hates these cans. (laughs) Get away from the cans. (laughs) Eric and Marilyn dance as the police car arrives. Inside, Moriarty's suspicions are confirmed by the C. Jarrett name printed on the door. When Eric hears the cops outside, he gives Marilyn more pills to take as she happily gobbles them down. (laughs) What are these? They just look like Altoids, but I don't know why she's taking them. Moriarty knocks down the door, unarmed, and Eric shoots him in the leg. He urges Oshimble not to fire on the kid while he tries to reason with Eric, and eventually he leans on the soothing psych talk (laughs) to persuade the kid over to his side of this conflict. Benford, you're out of your fucking mind! (laughs) Or that. (laughs) It was my note here. I was like, I can help you. You're out of your fucking mind! (laughs) Oshimble reprimands him. You and that goddamn therapy. (laughs) That was therapy? (laughs) What did you just say? Marilyn and Eric run directly down Hollywood Boulevard to Mann's Chinese Theater. Eric looks up at the roof of the building and gets an idea. He rushes inside, and the cop limps after him. Inside the theater, Moriarty again tries to reason with him, but Eric doesn't want to hear it. He runs up to the screen to hug it, and then starts bashing it with his arms when he can't break through to the other side. I, I'm hoping that this is like a prop screen or a screen that they're planning to replace. He's hitting it very lightly. I was worried about that, too. I was just like, Ugh. The the man's Chinese theater is going to be very angry if you punch a hole in their screen with your gun. But he's not able to break through the screen. The gold ticket is lost, and Jack Slater will die in there. Marilyn manages to talk the gun (laughs) out of his hand, but he takes it right back when Moriarty urges her to run with it. Yeah, yeah. She actually gets the gun out of his hand and starts to walk away, and then he yells, Run! Run for it, lady! It's just like, what? (laughs) The situation was under control. Outside, Gallagher tells the sharpshooters not to shoot unless Eric does, which is a terrible idea. Of course they should shoot if he points a gun at the innocent crowd of people. <laughs> also, start working on getting those people out of there. Yeah, that'd be Why good too. Why are just letting them stand there There's an watch. active shooter here. Yes. This isn't like a performance. Although, I'm pretty sure the implication here is that they're actually at the premiere of Coal Miner's Daughter. Because there's spotlights and there's big banners for Coal Miner's Daughter and there's a huge crowd outside at the beginning. So I think that's actually what they're supposed to be crashing here. Hmm. Which is funny because we talked about in uh, One Trick Pony where we're like, this is the first time that someone watched an 80s movie and then this movie has so many 80s movies in it. has them all. Eric gives Marilyn more pills and finally someone shoots Eric in the heart. He bows for the people and then he takes a few more shots. But he surfaces long enough to shout some more famous movie quotes from the platform on the roof. Go to Jared! Remember! I'm the Duke! It's made of a thousand faces. 
Prince of Darkness. At which point we both said, pizza, pizza. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I finally made it, Ma. Top of the world. And then he falls from the roof. Back in his room, we pan across his memorabilia collection. Apparently, the film originally ended with him doing a nude photo shoot with Marilyn at the studio when the cops just bust in and shoot him there. <laughs> and Dennis Christopher's like, that's not epic enough. It's it needs to be yeah. more movie related. Um, also in the script, Aunt Stella was not his mother. She was just his aunt. But apparently he had killed his own mother by cutting the brakes to her car a decade earlier. Most of the big plot changes were his suggestions, though, Dennis Christopher's. I feel like a shot that I would have liked before the memorabilia in his room would have been just a chalk outline over the Marilyn Monroe footprints. Mm. Because you could actually do that on the footprints without like damaging them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that's not what they did. And that's the end of our film. Our writer-director was Vernon Zimmerman. This was his final feature film directing. In 72, he directed something called Deadhead Miles, which starred Alan Arkin, Charles Durning, Hector Elizondo, Richard Keel, John Milius, Avery Schreiber, George Raft, Ida Lupino, Alan Garfield, and Barnard Hughes, with a script by Terrence Malick somehow. Dang. His last writing credit was for 1989's Teen Witch, <laughs> which is billed as a sort of gender-swapped teen wolf peppered with impromptu rap musical numbers, most famous among them being, of course, Top That. <laughs> Have you, you guys are familiar with Top That? No. Oh, I'm going to have to play it for you right now. I'm pretty sure I've seen Teen Witch, but let's it's been a while. No, just go up and talk to him. Are you kidding? I'm so embarrassed. Look at how funky he is. I will never be hip. I'm hot, and you're not. But if you want to hang with me, I'll give it one shot. Top that. Top that. You can do all that you can, but you'll never top that. Top that. So top that. <laughs> Disconnected, not respected Who would ever really want to go and top that? Such a waste of pretty face But hanging in your nose face I wish that you would take a look and really stop that Top that, well stop that I don't really give up about trying to top that Top that, stop that I wish you finally take a real look and really stop that What's this? Stop that, what give? Stop that, I don't really give up about trying to stop that Top that that yeah it's, it's pretty weird. wonderful it's weird how they she self-censors herself yeah she yes. skips the word <laughs> i don't really give up about trying to stop that dennis christopher played eric binford he was dave in breaking away he is adult eddie kasprak in stephen king's it tv miniseries not the not the new one not the new one he's leonid mogi in django unchained calvin candy's lawyer yeah there's no doubt in my mind that quentin was a big fan of this film and in particular uh, he likely identified with eric binford i would <laughs> guess uh, taking it a step further i wouldn't be shocked to learn that at some point in the process true romance had at least temporarily been titled alabama and the 40 thieves i haven't corroborated that anywhere i'm just making the observation that among the similarities that patricia arquette's character is named alabama and it's about her facing off against a bunch of criminals with a crazed film fanatic at her side. So it stands to reason. Tim Thomerson was Dr. Jerry Moriarty. He was doubles in Carney earlier this year. He plays Jack Death in the Trancer series. He's Rhodes in Metal Storm, The Destruction of Jared Sin. He makes an appearance in Sandra Locke's Rat Boy. He's <laughs> Loy Colton in Near Dark. And Hoodlum in Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Gwyn Guilford was Officer Anne Oshambol. She's Mrs. Winston in Masters of the Universe. She's Betty Getrer on Chips, the wife of Joseph Getrer, 
played by her real-life husband, Robert Pine, the father of actor Chris Pine. Norman Burton played Marty Berger. He plays Hunt Leader, the first ape to be seen by the audience in the original 1968 Planet of the Apes. He played the ill-fated engineer Will Giddings in The Towering Inferno, and he also played Felix Leiter in Diamonds Are Forever opposite Sean Connery for Connery's last canon appearance as the character. Linda Carriage played Marilyn O'Connor. This was her first feature film. The producers literally found her walking down La Cienega Boulevard and offered her the part. She played a Monroe double a second time this year for a German-language film called Go West, Young Man, written by Carol Streaken, a.k.a. Lurch from the Addams Family, who we had earlier this year in Die Laughing. She's our second actress this year to have doubled Monroe in multiple films after Misty Rowe as Duchess in The Man with Bogart's Face. I think Linda Carriage actually looks more like Monroe, but Misty had the voice down perfectly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Linda Carriage also plays Sparkle in Surf 2, which if, <laughs> if you've never seen Surf 2, part of the joke is that there's no Surf 1. It started with Surf 2, <laughs> but it's got Eddie Dees in it. It's a weird one. Morgan Paul played Gary Bialy. His first feature film appearance was as Captain Jensen in Patton. He's Dr. Newman in The Swarm. He plays Dave Holden in Blade Runner. He appeared alongside Linda Carriage in Surf 2 as a greedy businessman. And his final feature film role was as the mayor in the horror film Uncle Sam. He's also Wayne Billings in Norma Ray. James Luisi played Captain M.L. Gallagher. He was a professional basketball player playing in the 50s for both the Boston Celtics and the now-defunct Baltimore Bullets. He played Lieutenant Doug Chapman in 26 episodes of The Rockford Files. He was Ed in the original Ben. That's the one with the guy's friends with mice. He was George Benson in Norma Ray, and he played Roy in Star 80, which is the film about the killing of Galaxina star Dorothy Stratton by her jilted almost ex-husband. Eve Brent played Aunt Stella Binford, She played Jane opposite Gordon Scott's Tarzan in 1958's Tarzan's Fight for Life. She also played Elaine Connolly in The Green Mile, Mrs. Baker in Garfield the Movie, and an uncredited old woman in The Curious Case of Benjamin Button. John Steadman was Sam. He played Pop in The Longest Yard with Burt Reynolds. He's also Skeeter in White Lightning, and then took over the role of Ned McCluskey, father of Gator, in Gator, the sequel to White Lightning. He was the old man laughing in the welfare office earlier this year in Cheech and Chong's next movie, and he'll show up next in next year's Choo Choo and the Philly Flash. Oh, no. Now, which one, so he was Sam? Who is Sam in this movie? Sam is the security guard who spooks oh, the boss. Oh, okay. Um, he's also Fred in The Hills Have Eyes, and he appeared in that other Vernon Zimmerman movie, Deadhead Miles, that I mentioned earlier. Peter Horton was Joey. He plays Gary Shepard in 85 episodes of 30-something. He's Max Ryan on The Gina Davis Show. He played Bert in Children of the Corn. He was a cult member in Serial earlier this year, and he was married to Michelle Pfeiffer one year after this film came out. Mickey Rourke was Richie. He plays Henry Chinaski, a stand-in for Charles Bukowski in Barfly. This was only his second feature film after playing Reese in 1941, and he'll be back for Heaven's Gate this year. He's in Diner, Rumblefish, Spun. He was Billy in Once Upon a Time in Mexico, on the way to playing Marv in Sin City. He was Randy the Ram Robinson in Aronofsky's The Wrestler, and he's Ivan Vanko in Iron Man 2. Uh, I wanted to, because Jesse had mentioned the music, and uh, this composer for this film, uh, Craig Safan, um, I only really know him from having done one other movie. I'm sure he's got other credits, um, but just off the top of my head, uh, I know him from The Last Starfighter. Oh, okay. He composed the really amazing theme and music for The Last Starfighter, which will always be uh, my favorite. But he Why did... didn't they use it in the movie? <laughs> ah, right? Uh, he, he, he did things like uh, Vegas Vacation, Nightmare on Elm Street. He was, the I guess, the TV series composer for Cheers. Oh, okay. Oh, the, did we talk about him before then? Um, perhaps. Because uh, I feel like we had the whole conversation of... He did Die Laughing. Die Laughing, okay. Die Laughing. Uh, Which has so, posters so, in this movie. So maybe we did mention him before, but I wanted to mention him because yeah. uh, I love The Last Starfighter. Very cool. And I love his music for that movie. Yeah. There are 10 posters of 1980s films in this movie. Posters or marquees. One was Black Marble, which we didn't cover this year, but we'll cover it next year. 
Can you guys name the other nine movies <laughs> oh, that appear as posters or marquees within this film no, from not. 1980 specifically? Well, Coal Miner's Daughter. Right. We've covered one. all of them. Die Laughing. Die Laughing, Coal Miner's Daughter. That's two. Uh, Happy Hooker was in there? No. Nope. No, it wasn't. Um... Sorry, I'm going through, the, <laughs> going through my letterbox list. That's a good idea. Little Darlings. There was a poster for Little there Darlings. Was. Little Darlings yep. is in there. there That's was. three of the nine. Little Miss Marker was in there. Yep. Was the Earthling in there? No. Mm-hmm. Simon? Simon was in Simon there. Simon was in there. Nice. That was at the end when they're getting ready to fall off the roof. Yeah. Hide in Plain Sight was in there, wasn't That's it? That's right. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and was it Dressed to Kill? No, Dressed to Kill. No. Nijinsky. Nijinsky, Nijinsky was, was definitely yeah. in there. Yep, yep, yep. So I think we have two left that you haven't said. Is it Windows? Because we said, no, no, no not windows. windows. We said Nijinsky, Die Laughing, Coal Miner's Daughter, Hide in Plain Sight, Little Miss Marker, Little Darlings, and Simon. Should I start giving tips? Gosh. Cereal. Cereal was one oh, of them. Oh, yes, yes, you're And then right, there's right. one left. Boy. Better not be coast to coast. It's not coast to coast. <laughs> I think I, I think I need a hint. I can't remember. Richard, do you need a hint? Um, um otherwise I'm gonna just start guessing. Okay, let's try and think of uh, how can I give a hint for this. It takes place on an island. <laughs> uh, that's zombie? a few movies. It's not zombie. The island. The island. It's not the island. <laughs> When time ran out? Blue Lagoon! When time ran oh. out. <laughs> <laughs> How many movies take place on islands in I thought 1980s? that would actually be kind of a trick because there's so many island movies. And I didn't think that When Time Ran Out would <laughs> jump out as an <laughs> island movie. But yeah. it takes place on the island of Hawaii. Yeah, Last Flight of Noah's Ark. We could just keep naming island movies. Yeah, there's a lot of island movies. Did you guys say Blue Lagoon or no? I did. She did say, yeah. Did you say Blue Lagoon? I did. What about Blue Lagoon? Um, yeah. Big Red One. They were in Sicily, weren't they? <laughs> Does that count? C- occasionally on an island. <laughs> that counts. Um, yeah. Um, this movie is fun in places. Too much of it doesn't make sense for me. It still gets a thumbs up because it's fun. I really like the core concept of this yes. movie. Um, and there was a lot of things that I really liked about it aesthetically. Um, and I just feel like they could they could have done this better you know like i i could i could definitely see a remake of this happening would the remake be present day a guy obsessed with movies from the 80s like what we're doing oh god or Don't would go it go to sleep richard would it be um, <laughs> would it be like stranger things where the character is in the 80s again i think it's i think it's throwback okay because i think there is something about the appeal of like classic cinema yeah that um lends itself really well to this especially you know sort of classic murder type things where where we're having him dress as a a dracula or a mummy or something like that but i i do like the idea of of making it a little clearer as like a descent into madness yeah but there's also a lot about this movie that reminds me of um it almost feels like like a john waters kind of movie sure there, there's elements of it yeah. that feel like that and i feel like if you pushed it a lot further it would have been even better because i just think you needed it to be more eccentric yeah i think it would have been cool if he was killing a lot of people by the end instead of just sort of ambiguously drugging a girl i don't yeah. even know what he's giving her or yeah. what effect it's supposed to have i don't know if she's supposed to be dead at the end of the movie I don't know what's happening or like and and have those and have those little moments of like buffalo bill kind of moments where we're seeing him in his craziness you know preparing for the things that he's going to be doing you know what i feel like is a good it's a good remake that already exists of this is the cable guy it's just tv instead of film Mm. but he's obsessed with like the golden age television stuff and he's taking on all these personas and and he gets getting crazier and crazier and he also is thrown off of a thing at the end and lands <laughs> on his back i think that um if there was a remake it should have more famous death scenes like the whole like pushing the wheelchair down the, the stairs is like okay so he's gonna kill people 
in in these famous cinematic ways. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and then that, none of them. And are the, like yeah, that. other than that, it, it's it doesn't happen. Yeah. Um. So I would think you would need more of that in the remake. Mm-hmm. Like so, but someone falling off a tower like Vertigo. You're getting prohibitively expensive though. If we're going to be using these clips or or referencing these films, like I think. Unless you, you got like Spielberg lined up to direct it, that's true. And it's going to be just like a super dark Ready Player One. Well, or but maybe you are you know Universal and you just stick to the movies that you already have the rights to. I almost to. thought they were all Universal at the beginning because, except for obviously um, when the lady falls down the stairs from White Heat, it's 20th Century Fox because he says the billing and everything at the end. But so many of them are psycho or universal monster movies that that are universal already like i feel like they could have swapped it out creatively and kept it in studio and just had but obviously universal wasn't the distributor for this film yeah so yeah but i'm just saying if you're gonna do a remake i don't think it has to be prohibitively expensive if you're a studio that has a back catalog that you could really leverage that's true and i and i think that this has such an appeal to movie nerddom that you could do it in a way where you're like, yeah, like you're saying, it's a Ready Player One where it's just like it's got so much in like, what are they like Easter egg type things? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that you that the fans are gonna love it. That's true. No, I could definitely see a remake of this coming together that was set in the '90s. Yeah, but I agree with you. I think I would give it an up just because like I like those core things about it. Um, and with a little tweaking, I think it it. It could it could be better, but yeah. it's overall it's an up. Yeah, I'd say I'd say it's an up. Uh, it's a down for me. Yeah, I, I really didn't care for this movie much at all, uh, and I really don't know what else to say. I'm trying to think. Uh, have we had another like incel type character so far this year? I can't think of one. I feel like this is the first guy who's been like like angry at people thinking he deserves stuff that he mm-hmm. just by nature of existing. Yeah. I can't think of any others, but that, that is another weird thing that Marilyn, it goes for him at all because I just don't think that that's realistic. Yeah. <laughs> and But it's weird because in other movies it doesn't, it doesn't throw me off as much when the girl is, although, I mean, I guess it's, it's weird because true romance is a lot like this movie. There's this girl who looks a lot like, the there's an outfit that Marilyn wears in this movie that specifically reminded me of Alabama in True Romance, and she's falling for this um, Christian Slater character who is just obsessed with movies and hangs out in the movie theater all night and has mm-hmm. all these characters memorized and just wants to be the heroes from his movies. So there's there's a lot of like connective tissue between those two stories. The other one I thought would be more connected and I rewatched it and it's not is uh, Cecil B. Demented. Mm. But that's more of like a Pulgasari story where they kidnap this famous actress and force her to make a movie um, at gunpoint. But then she gets Stockholm Syndrome and it's like uh, it's like Patty Hearst, uh, which is funny because she's in the movie. Um, I mean, if we're comparing it to other movies from 1980, it's a little bit like Dress to Kill in that he's, you know, going into this delusion of this other character and yeah. working his frustration out through murdering the people. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's the t- for 1980 specifically the similarity is is mostly to Bogart's face for me, where it's just a guy who is like almost unexplainably obsessed with movies from this one specific time period, and it factors into everything he does for his whole daily life. Mm-hmm. And they both kill a lot of people. Um. Yeah. Letterboxed. What do you think, Jess? I have that at the 72 spot, which is below Windows and above Hollywood Nights. Uh, I have this uh, much lower. I have this at 88. Okay. Um, This puts it below Phobia and above Return of the Sakaka 7. Okay. You liked Phobia better than this? I did. (laughs) Interesting. Um, I'm going to split the difference. I have it about halfway between you guys. I have it at 73rd place which is right under Man with Bogart's Face and right above One Trick Pony. So there's connections to both of those movies because they both feature 80s movies within the story. Um, But yeah, I think that's everything we have for this one. If you guys have any thoughts you'd like to share with us, we are Vintage Video Pod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Letterboxd. 
or as I've said before, you can find each of our full movie rankings for the year. We can also be found at vintagevideopodcast.com. Please consider rating us on iTunes to help people find the show. And if you take the time to leave us a review, we will thank you personally in an upcoming episode. If you're feeling especially generous, you can also support the show through patreon.com slash vintagevideopodcast. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time when we'll be discussing Foolin' Around, which IMDb describes like so. A working class boy falls for a girl from a wealthy family and must compete for her with a rich boy who also wants her. We leave you now with a trailer for Foolin' Around. We've done this many, many times before. Just think of it as a little game. We're going to ask you some questions, and you answer right or wrong. And if you answer correctly, you get a little shock, that's all. A little what? A little shock. It's a study of depression. If we tell you any more, it will spoil the results. Well, I was just looking for a part-time job. Where are you going? Can you hear me out there? Mr. McDaniels, please don't shout. I can hear you fine. Okay, Mr. McDaniels. Uh, This is just an example of how the experiment works. Is the object I'm holding right or wrong? Right or wrong for what? No, just respond right or wrong. A banana? I guess it's wrong. Oh, that was very good, Mr. McDaniels. Very good. (laughs) Well, why was it wrong? I'm sorry, we can't tell you that. Okay, now we're going to begin the experiment, so pay strict attention. You're not responding, Mr. McDaniels. Is this object right or wrong? I would say it's right. Mr. McDaniels, wrong was right. How many volts are you putting through me? Pay attention, please. Well, I don't think I want to do this. Right or wrong, Mr. McDaniels?